Hey guys, I've been talking for a couple of weeks about a caliber throwdown. Pretty much we're going to be talking about the 9mm, the 40 caliber, and the 45. And I know this is an age old argument. We're not necessarily going to put an end to that argument. I don't think what I'm going to be providing is going to do that. But I think what it will do is give you guys enough evidence to make your, up your mind about what round you feel like is best suited for you. And that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, what their pedigree is. It doesn't matter what their credentials are and what they tell you to use. It's what works for you and what gun you have that you're comfortable with and what works for you. So we're also going to shoot just Glocks on this, the subcompact Glocks is all we're gonna be shooting. When we get to the point of, quote, accuracy and recoil, felt recoil, that's gonna give us a better indicator so that no one out there can say, well, you used too light of a gun when you shot this, or you used too heavy of a gun, or that gun has a stronger recoil spring than what this other model would be. Um, so we're gonna try to level that playing field out as best as we can to give you guys the opportunity to make a very educated judgment on this. Today, we're gonna be kicking it off with a little bit of history. What I'm trying to do is I want to show you guys the history behind each round before we get into those actual comparisons. So today we're kicking it off just from a size standpoint. We're starting at the bottom. No, no particular order that we're picking here other than nine is smaller, then we move to the 40 cal, then we move to the 45. Again, there's no preference issues in, involved in these whatsoever. So I'm going to give you history behind each caliber. So today's video will be strictly based on the nine millimeter. And um, there's some cool history behind all three of these rounds. So let's get right into this one. The nine millimeter Parabellum by Deutsch Waffen Munitions Wackenbrocken. <laughs> my, my German is not that great. Uh, did I say my German? I don't have any German. So we're going to call them DWM as the uh, original manufacturer of the nine millimeter, which is a German company. Now to get to know the 9mm, you have to get to know the Luger P08. The P08 was a pistol developed um, in search of a round, not a 9mm developed and then people made guns. It was just the opposite. Uh, the gun was actually manufactured and they were like, all right, we need something to shoot in it now. The Luger was pretty much redesigned after the older C93 of Huger Borchor. Of course, the Luger was designed by George Luger himself. The genius of the C93 at that time was the fact that it was a self-loading pistol. That was not heard of around that time. But the C93 was clunky, uncomfortable, and delicate, and not to be trusted by the military and law enforcement, so the pistol never really caught on, which that left the door open for George Luger and his brand new pistol, the Luger P08 in 19, I'm excuse me, 1898. The P08 was originally designed to fire the 7.65 by 21 round, but the German military needed something a little bit bigger. They wanted a bigger hunk of lead to be fired out of this thing. So that's when DWM actually went into, all right, we got to figure something out, and they developed a 9mm round. Now, there was a few things they did to it. They took the older 7.65 by 21mm round, they chopped the smaller round down, ditched the bottleneck brass to accept a larger piece of lead, and just like that, they had a 9mm round, and that's where the design actually stuck. From there, the 9mm was good to go. They kept that, that particular design. The round was created as the 9 by 19 millimeter parabellum. Interestingly, the, the word parabellum has some pretty cool history behind it. It's taken from the Latin phrase CV pecum parabellum, which translates to mean, if you seek peace, prepare for war. That's pretty cool. DWM, the company that manufactured the 9 millimeter that created it, actually uh, made that their motto, if you seek peace, prepare for war, for the actual company, company motto. That's pretty cool. By 1900, the Luger in 9mm could be purchased in the United States, but it hadn't really caught on that much. You know, there were some that were catching on, but again, not like the rest of the world that was really, really gravitating to the 9mm as far as a handgun goes, and even some submachine guns. America, we liked our 357s, our single action Colts, you know, guns of that nature, our 38s. So we liked bigger hunks of lead. So the 9mm was a little bit slow to catch on in the US. One of the main reasons was because the US military wanted something chambered in 45 caliber. They wanted that bigger hunk of lead that the 45 was in. And they actually were interested in the design. They liked the way the Luger was manufactured and made and the way it shot. They just didn't care for the smaller round. So they actually got a 9mm Luger redesigned to fire a 45 ACP for testing purposes. It never really caught on. But interesting piece there that they, the Luger actually did have some test models back then in 45 ACP to test the round in it. Of course, we all know by 1911 what happened. John Moses Browning, uh, you know, one of the gun gods of all time, the greatest gun gods of all time, he had already developed by then the 1911 to shoot 45 ACP, and that's all the U.S. was good with. We were like, all right, we found it, we're good, 
that's that's our gun that's our round we're good to go so the nine millimeter and the, the 19 excuse me the po8 were were never even thought of again we had established what we wanted and we were moving on from there now let's fast forward all the way to 1980 obviously there's a huge chunk of time in between the 1911 era and 1980 but a lot of that was consumed by world war one and world war ii which the nine millimeter and the po8 luger were very very popular and heavily heavily used back then along with the high power of course too um, during those uh, World War II era. So let's fast forward to 1980. Okay, remember, the United States had not gravitated to the 9mm at that point. We still kind of liked our big bore stuff. Um, most of the guys were, were packing 38, 357, 45 ACP. But in the 1980s, you know, most of these guys out there had revolvers. And the problem with revolvers, of course, was round count. I know you have your speed loaders, but they were still revolver type speed loaders and they, they carried low rounds. In the 1980s, you'll remember the drug cartels were very, very strong, and they came on strong during that era. Cocaine was huge, coming on huge, coming in from Colombia. Colombia and the drug cartels had plenty of money. With that money, they spent it on weapons, and they were not letting the U.S. influence their, their guns, or their choice of guns. Hey, if somebody else on the other, other side of the planet had a, a higher capacity, faster shooting, faster reloading uh, gun of any sort, they wanted it, and they got it. They spent that money on it. What that in turn did is that made us, as the U.S., our law enforcement and DEA get completely outgunned because these guys were still carrying revolvers in many cases. So that made the U.S. open up their eyes and say, all right, guys, we got to do something else because we're getting completely outgunned uh, by these cartels. And I mean, it was making a big impact and it made a big impact. Now, of course, the U.S. loved the 45 ACP in the 1911, but that seven to eight round count was not enough. There was way too many reloads. That big fat 45 caliber round was just too tough. It was too hard to carry the amount of ammo that you actually needed to shoot. So the U.S. started looking in other areas. What can we do? What can we do for a higher capacity without us carrying a gun that has a grip this, this wide and this long in 45? The Beretta 92 and the Glock 17 around in that period of time, late 80s, early 90s, were bursting onto the scene. Everybody from the left coast to the uh, east coast were, were, were scooping these things up. Again, the Glock 17 and the Model 92 uh, were, were, were huge. They were much higher capacity. You could really stack the rounds in there. So really in that time frame of the early to mid 80s, the 9mm had really caught on with FBI, law enforcement, you name it. I mean, across the country, that was the round. You know, higher round count. Uh, guys weren't having any problems shooting them and everybody was happy. The 1986 rolled around. Two bank robbers had a shootout with the FBI, and man, it was not pretty. The two bank robbers were sustaining shots. One in particular got shot, I want to say through the arm, and came up through into, into his side and went into his internals. He did receive a shot that ultimately ended up killing him, but because it was a 9 millimeter round, it did not create enough damage as it entered. This guy was able to continue to shoot, and theoretically, based on the times that, that the shots took place and all that, it was determined that even after this guy had sustained that ultimately that ultimate fatal wound, he still ended up killing a couple of the FBI guys. So they feel like, or the FBI felt like at that point, hey, if we'd have had a round that would have made him sustain some life-threatening damage a lot quicker to where to have more of an impact, more of an internal wound damage uh, type round, then he may have gone down at that point and not been able to continue on in the fight and those other two guys might not have been shot. And he might have been, they might have been right about this. This resulted in the FBI preferring the more powerful 10 millimeter round and actually gravitating to it, but they ended up settling for the less powerful, short and weaker 40 Smith & Wesson. Same size round, but a uh, same size bullet projectile, but a different size casing and of course powder on the inside. Now look, there's a whole lot of maybes or what ifs or what really happened behind the scenes and we're not going to go into all that today but i have heard a couple of different different theories one was that the 10 millimeter that the fbi was looking at they had uh, knocked the powder down so much on it because people uh that were testing it some females and smaller men of course sorry it's just a fact if that hurts anybody's feelings uh, we're not able to handle the power of the 10 millimeter round. So the 10 millimeter was downsized as far as powder in it. Well, the next thing you know, you got a, a larger 10 millimeter round that you're shaking it and you just got a little bit of powder in it. 
So they said, well, why don't we just shorten the whole thing? And that's how the 40 caliber Smith & Wesson came to be. I think they worked with Winchester on this also. So again, instead of having the longer 10 millimeter half full of powder, they just shortened the casing, put the same projectile in it, and they put the same amount of powder in it that they'd had it originally in the 10 millimeter. It's just that now you had it in a smaller package. After that, as the FBI goes, the rest of law enforcement in the country typically go. So everybody started getting the 40s. 40 Smith & Wesson was super hot. Everybody was making a gun in them. Sometimes they'd make a gun. Some people were putting out guns in 40 caliber before they were even available in the previously very popular 9mm. So the 40 pretty much took the world by storm. However, with the advancement of gunpowder, um, certainly projectiles, the technology in projectiles and the way things were were bonded where you could do core bonding and things of that nature certainly made the effect on this of smaller rounds whether it be the nine millimeter of, or others much much more effective because now the technology had caught up now I am also one that understands that if the technology of a nine millimeter increases well so does the technology of a 40 so in other words just by making better technology did not make the nine as good as the 40 the 40 increased too in productivity so you certainly have an increase in all but what it did was if the threshold of effectiveness was right here this is the line and the nine was below it well even though the 40 was above it in terms of uh, wound ballistics and effectiveness there if the nine was below it and the technology made it more lethal well now all of them are lethal just that the 40 now would be more lethal than what it was before whereas the nine millimeter actually may have become lethal to begin with during all of this time the fbi put forth a pretty rigorous set of testing guidelines to determine what is the best round for us out there and it was pretty eye-opening what they came up with and pretty interesting. They actually determined that on average, 70 to 80% of law enforcement officers missed their targets when firing in high stress situations. Can you imagine having 10 rounds in your gun? I'm just using 10 for the sake of math because I am no mathematician. If you had 10 rounds in your magazine and you shot all 10 of them and you only hit your target two or three times. So as you can see, Round count was very important to the FBI at that point. Now, I don't know who they had testing these guns, but I know they were testing them in some very high stress situations. And if that is in fact a fact, a, a legitimate fact, that is mind boggling to me. And as a, as, as a regular guy, as an average guy with no formal background or training or anything like that, that makes me want to gravitate towards round count even more. Now, I also understand, I'm not necessarily talking about the FBI because they have a lot more interaction with guns, but especially you guys in law enforcement, you're going to understand what I'm talking about. A lot of law enforcement guys are not the best shot to begin with. They qualify sometimes once or twice a year with their guns. In most cases, and in many cases, that's the only two times a year that they actually shoot their sidearms. So in many cases, they're not, quote, gun guys. So I kind of understand, you can talk to law enforcement guys and they'll tell you, I'm not saying all law enforcement guys, but you can talk to law enforcement guys and they will tell you, I know guys who don't shoot their guns except whenever they're qualifying twice a year. So that may have a little bit to do with it. The average Joes that are hitting the range every single week, we may not have that formal training, but we do have famili familiarity, <laughs> if I could say that, uh, with their pistols and um, definitely know their way around it and are more comfortable and familiar with it and probably have perfected the art of hitting the target. Now, that doesn't mean when stress creeps into it and you've got another guy shooting a gun back at you that that makes you any more accurate, okay? I get that. But I think at least being more comfortable with your weapon and knowing your way around it, that's got to be a little bit of a plus right there. And maybe we knock those numbers down from being 70 to 80% misses. As we mentioned, the terminal ballistics and the wound ballistics that the FBI uh, looked into in terms of these newer rounds, that had a big hand also. You know, you're talking about round count, controlling uh, the pistol, and of course, terminal ballistics. Those were the three main factors that made the FBI turn back to the nine millimeter, and essentially the rest of the country did too, and nine millimeter guys are back happy again because the, now the 40s are falling by the wayside. If you go into any given store, I'm talking about stores that I know of that are stocking anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine hundred guns in stock, total guns in stock. If you ask them for something in a 40 caliber, you will find something, but you're probably not gonna always find all, like say your Glock 23 or uh, you know the 22. 
you're not necessarily going to find those. Those things were hot as heck 10, 15 years ago, but now they've kind of moved off because the FBI pushed back to the nine millimeter and so did everybody else. One of the examples of why the nine millimeter was proven kind of ineffective in the older round was involving Jeff Cooper. If you guys know Jeff, Jeff Cooper, he was, uh, God rest his soul, he's the developer of Gunsight Academy, extremely popular and effective training school out west. It, he developed what was called uh, the Mozambique drill. During the Mozambican war in the late 60s and early 70s, a Rhodesian mercenary named Mike Russo was fighting at the airport of Lorenco Marquez. My French is not any better than my, uh, <laughs> than my German, so forgive me. Russo turned the corner and right in his face was a gorilla, uh, guys he was fighting against, right? This guy had an AK-47. Russo snatched up his Browning High Power, chambered a nine millimeter, bop, bop. This guy was a trained fighter. Bop, bop, two shots, bam, bam. Each side of the chest, all right? Enough that would have dropped most anybody. But because of the, the poor wound ballistics back then of the nine millimeter round, the guy kept advancing towards him. And that's whenever Rousseau went up to give him a headshot, missed the head, but hit him right in the base of the throat, and of course severed his spinal cord and the guy dropped after that. That's where you get the two in the, in the torso and one in the headshot. Pop, pop, double tap, and then come up and get you one later. That's where all, that's called the Mozambique uh, drill. That's where all of that originated. And it originated, in fact, because the nine millimeter did not drop someone that it would have normally today, based on our wound ballistics now, and the, the type of round, I should say, um, the rounds are much more effective. You know, and the way they're built today and the impact they would have had certainly would have dropped the guy back then. But again, that just shows the ineffectiveness of the older nine millimeter rounds back then. And we also can't forget that NATO rounds are ball ammunition too. Think of some of the greatest rounds manufactured today with the best gunpowder and all that good stuff, but you put a ball, piece of ball ammo in it also. You know, your wound ballistics are gonna be garbage as a result of that. So that had a big hand in why the nine millimeter round was not effective in those circles too. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, the, the thing I want everybody to leave this video with is that the nine millimeter is a great round. I know we're doing a, uh, you know, our caliber throw down here and we're not necessarily trying to show what's the best round, 9, 40, 45. We're trying to leave that up to you guys. But I can tell you that the whole reason why we have this argument is because all three rounds are pretty good rounds, right? I mean, we're not talking about some of these other rounds out there. I like the 38 and I like the 357, but you notice we're not having a conversation about those guys. We're talking about 9s, 40s, and 45s. Three very good rounds. I'm not going to come out here to the range and talk about guns and ammo and not go shoot, right? I'm gonna take my arm score ammo, I'm gonna take the Glock that we're gonna be filming the series with, and I'm gonna go out here and I'm gonna shoot this thing. One of the cool things is, in our next videos, the next one in line is gonna be the 40 Smith & Wesson, and we're gonna talk about the same things we did like the nine, its own history and how it came about. Then we're gonna do the same with the 45. After that, we're actually gonna run all three of them together, and again, in subcompact style Glocks, and then we can show you guys the effectiveness on the range of each one of these rounds as equal as we can. And we will be doing those in all arms corps. Again, we're trying to keep this playing field by being all Glocks and subcompact models and all arms corps ammunition, which I find to be very consistent. We want to try to make this level playing field as level as possible so that the results can speak for themselves and not have any asterisks next to this. Guys, thank you for watching. As always, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we really appreciate that. Follow us on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Gun District. Uh, all places that we're very flattered when you guys reach out to us. We love getting your email. Please email me at paul at legallyarmedamerica.com. I love getting your email. I do respond to emails. I'm very responsive. So we like to interact with you guys. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us. We will see you next time.